So again, this is, uh, this is Ben Harvey with the Missouri Telehealth Network. Um, and this is a, a webinar entitled Telehealth in Missouri's Health Centers. Uh, so we had done a webinar a few months ago that was focused on Medicaid, and I realized at that point uh, that there was some interest, I think, from uh, the folks in the health center community as to go a, a little bit deeper into issues surrounding telehealth, not just Medicaid. Part of this is Medicaid. Uh, if you want more on the Medicaid piece, we can, we can hook you up with the previous webinar. But this is a little bit deeper dive into what telehealth means for health centers. Uh, and so, first off, I just want to make sure everyone knows, just, I feel like I have to say this, I am not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. Uh, this is more of uh, perspectives from someone that's been in the field for a while uh, and has a fairly good understanding of things. But this, if, if you think uh, you need legal advice, by all means, please, please seek out your counsel. I am, I am not that. So, really, for me, uh, one of the things that I, I've experienced uh, over the last 10 years in, in, my, in my career has been uh, the idea of telehealth as a, uh, 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 an unfulfilled, uh, an unfulfilled uh, way to improve access to care. So everybody, uh, when I'd go to conferences or something like that, I'd hear the, uh, about how telehealth had not improved access the way it was supposed to, um, you know, it's kind of an unfulfilled dream of, of getting folks into in to see physicians over telehealth. But now I think the time really is 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 around to, to consider to consider telehealth as a means of improving access to care. And this is what a health center needs to know. So briefly, let's let's start off, and I'll I'll go through some background information here. Uh, and this is. Uh, it's kind of setting the stage, uh, kind of giving you a background of the milieu right now uh, for, uh, regarding telehealth, and then we'll get into a little bit more specifics towards health centers. So this was a Politico uh, article about a hospital without patients, something that 10 years ago even was probably inconceivable, uh, and it's a, it's a pretty advanced thing, and, and I think you all know what I'm talking about here. This is Mercy's telehealth network. This is Mercy Virtual in St. Louis, so not in Silicon Valley, but here in Missouri. This is a, a facility where physicians, uh, nurse practitioners go in and see patients. No patients come into this, into this facility. The physicians, uh, the providers all go out into Mercy's uh, various, uh, various hospitals, uh, outpatient clinics. And this is a, a big investment. This is something that's now possible with telehealth, where, where you wouldn't have seen that 10 years ago, where you had a lot of specialty equipment that was necessary. Now you can, you can, you can do something like this. Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Permanente, based out of California, 52% of their patient transactions last year happened online. And you can see the picture here where it's an iPad. This type of stuff is now possible, uh, where you couldn't have done this you know, six, seven years ago because of the limitations of technology. Now you can, I could do this right now online. I could pull up on my cell phone, uh, American Well, the, the insurance that we get to the University of Missouri. I can see a doc right now if I need to using my, my, my phone. Uh, over LTE or 4G. So you, you see a big health system where they're saying now patients are, are it, it's not, it's no longer a, a specialty offering, it's something that patients expect. Uh, hang on, okay. So uh, this is the VA, the VA is taking advantage of this pretty significantly. Let me go ahead and find out there's some background noise here. Undetermined. But they have to have HIV infection. Hang on just a second. Make sure you stay on mute if you can. I've got some of that background. Try to find it. Sorry for the interruption there. I gotta find the, the box. Any negative. Cool. Okay, and then you want it back. You want all that sent at one point from 100. Please make sure you stay on mute if you. Now, okay. Now I understand. Let me find who it is. Uh -huh. <laughs> there we go. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so the VA health system again. This is they, they've been uh, big adopters of, of telehealth. So in 2016. Uh, 700,000 veterans receive telehealth services, which is a pretty robust number. I mean, that's, that's probably 10% at least of the veteran community. Uh, they rolled out something just this past summer called VA Video Connect, which again allows visits via phone or via personal computer. So you, you download the app and you can see your doc at the VA, uh, at, at the VA wherever you are. And the VA has gone so far actually to change their regulations to say that uh, they're essentially skirting the state licensing law, or constantly skirting this by bad work, but they're, they're saying that state licensing law does not behold VA physicians to being able to see a, uh, 
uh, veteran, their patient, uh, across state lines. No, so no, no matter where that veteran is located, let's say there's a veteran located in Kentucky and the provider is located in Missouri, if they're working for the VA, state licensing laws do not do not uh, inhibit that provider from seeing that that veteran. So you're essentially on your phone, and you can see wherever you are in the country. If you're a veteran, you can see your your provider through the VA through this VA Video Connect. That's again something that was really inconceivable ten years ago. The advancements of cell phones, the advancements of technology, have really enabled, I think, now telehealth to fulfill the promises uh, that it was it was originally. Uh, seen uh, to, to make possible. So this is something to keep in mind, just again, background information, maybe a little bit too much, but I want to make sure you know this. This is 5G. It's coming around, right? 4G technologies, things like Lyft, things like Uber, uh, you know, FaceTime on your cell phone, Netflix on your cell phone. That was possible because of 4G. Well, we're right around the corner for having 5G, uh, which again, is just an expansion, a continued expansion of the, of the capabilities. Uh, of uh, accessing information over the internet or transmitting information over the internet. So vastly increasing the speed from which these things occur. The face-to-face -face connection uh, that you can now have with your cell phone was made possible essentially through 4G and 5G is right around the corner. So again, pushing the boundaries of what's possible, especially relative to telehealth. This, specific is, to, this is specific to Missouri. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but the FCC, Missouri was the biggest benefactor of the FCC expansion uh, to provide broadband services. And so, uh, so uh, $254 million to expand broadband over a period of 10 years. You can see the counties that are shaded there. Uh, and they're expecting about 95,000 rural Missouri homes and businesses across 90 counties to, to have broadband expansion. So again, one of the limitations it was previously noted with telehealth is that there was that lack of access to broadband and forget 4G technology coming around with cell phones, 5G technology, the expansion of broadband, that limitation has really been significantly reduced if not completely taken away. Let's talk about some real numbers quickly to show you the expansion of telehealth and how, and how far it's come. So this is a MedPAC report, which is a Medicare Patient and Payment Advisory Committee. They noted a 78% increase in two years in the number of telehealth services. I'll show you this, the scale here. So from 2006 to 2016, you can see at least a tenfold increase uh, in the amount of services provided to Medicare beneficiaries. So this is Medicare. This is distant site services per 1,000 beneficiaries. You can see it was less than one in 2006. And by 2016, it's gone up to almost 10 out of 1,000. Still, uh, still a small percent, but that rate of increase uh, is is tremendous, and I would expect that to continue to go up. And Medicare, in fact, expects that to go up. That's why they did this report. Uh, JAMA article talking about global telemedicine market in 2016 is valued at eight, 18 billion dollars, and it's going to be double that by 2022. 20, uh, so again, the idea of this is the unfulfilled promise of telehealth. I think is now finally being fulfilled. We're seeing this uh, increase at, at a very rapid rate. Uh, so what about Missouri? What's, what's going on in Missouri? This is MoHealthNet telehealth encounters by county. You can see in 2010, most counties had 10 or fewer uh, telehealth claims through MoHealthNet. By the time you get to 2015, and if we had 16 and 17, you'd see this, uh, we've really increased to the point where most all counties now have at least 50 claims. Uh, again, a small number, but you can see a, a large number of counties now have at least 500 plus claims. Uh, from telehealth. So again, telehealth is, is pretty rapidly expanding. And once it starts, it, it doesn't stop. You don't see counties go backwards. Once they start seeing patients via telehealth, that really becomes an expectation, I think, from the patients. And the use of it from a provider standpoint makes it such that once it starts, it doesn't stop. It doesn't scale back. What about health centers? So let's talk about uh, the folks that are on the call. So this is from UDS data. This is national UDS data. This is 2016. It's the only time I've seen uh, UDS measures ask about telehealth. So the question was, are you using telehealth? And health centers responded uh, 523. So 38% of the total said, yes, we are using telehealth. And if so, how are you using telehealth? Most use telehealth services to provide mental health services, so about half. That's national data. This is Missouri data from 2016. So again, asking you guys this question, are you using telehealth? Half of you said yes. And the vast majority of you said, if you are using telehealth, you're using it to provide mental health services. And so I know these are old numbers. So one of the ways I know, obviously, is to provide oral health services. Comtree out in eastern Missouri, I know they're providing oral health services via telehealth now. And I'd imagine that number, that 14 number, has probably gone 
up. Most of you probably are providing to some degree some telehealth services, uh, but still, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good number. So let's talk, let's, let's get more specific here. That's the background, telehealth's expanding. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, possibilities that, that we haven't seen before. Uh, people are using it more, the expectations there. So let's talk specifically about health centers. How does telehealth affect, uh, affect you? So I wanna start and, and talk about the scope, scope of projects, something you're all familiar with. So how does telehealth affect scope? That's a question I get asked not infrequently. So this is the scope of project. This is Form 5A. These are the required services that the health centers are required to provide. You probably are all familiar with this. And you have the, the three categories, right? Direct, you have formal written contract, or you have formal written, written referral. So where does telehealth fit in all of this? Well, HRSA said uh, a couple of years ago, and this is still true now, from the 2014, the last time they put together the scope of project, the last time they, they read the forms, the last time they did the alignments, they made the claim within this that telehealth is a means of delivering care, not a service type. Uh, so telehealth is not a, a unique line item since telehealth is a means for delivering care and it's not a separate service. So uh, if you're providing telehealth, uh, it's not, a, it's not uh, something you have to uniquely identify on your, scope, uh, uh, on your scope. Because again, it's a means, it's not a service type itself. Uh, so how does that affect if you if you uh, if you need to if you're changing the way you provide care or you uh, if you're already providing I don't know OB services and you have an OBGYN if you decide to offer those services via telehealth is that is that something that requires you to do a change in scope uh, no uh, generally telehealth services again because they're a means of delivering care they do not require you to change to, uh, to uh, formally go through either a scope adjustment or a formal change in scope. That would be unless you're adding an additional or specialty service or an additional service site. Uh, so oftentimes telehealth will change uh, the service site, service sites that you see. A, a good example I think would be something like uh, mobile units where you're, you're kind of you're going throughout the county. People aren't just coming to one building, you're going throughout the county. So if you would start seeing folks uh, at their home, for example, then it would, it would be something that you would have to note in a different way, obviously, because you're adding additional service sites. So some of the information I have here I've included for, uh, for you when you get the slides after the webinar. I don't want to read everything, but I wanted to have all the information packed into these slides so when you have that, you have the information. So this is just an example of what uh, the scope adjustments, what requires a formal CIS. But again, telehealth is a means of delivering care. It's not, it's not a service line itself, if that makes sense. Again, this is just the site, the service sites. This is Form 5B. If you're going to add a new service site in, uh, then you, you do need to do a, a, an adjustment there. So let's talk about MoHealth and Medicaid. This is the one that's had the, the most substantial change for the past six months. This is probably the thing that means the most to you guys since uh, most health centers, the vast majority, or the, the majority of patients that you serve are on Medicaid. So let's talk about that. So uh, go back about six months, go back to February. MoHealthNet said they are rescinding their current regulation regarding telehealth services, and they're just wiping the slate clean. This was a pretty unique thing. I, I worked in state government for a number of years, and it was rare for uh, an agency just to rescind completely a rule. And they did this for, I think, a couple different reasons. Primarily, there was uh, two statutes that were passed back in 2016, they were in conflict with, their regulations were in conflict with. So they just removed those regulations uh, and, and said they were going to follow those, those statutes, those two laws. This was further, uh, or I, I want to mention this, this was further uh, uh, etched into stone, I should say. It's no longer just MoHealthNet saying this is, you know, our regulations are, are this. So this, this past legislative session, this law went into effect on August 28th, like everything else. It essentially removed the regulatory authority of MoHealthNet to change uh, and uh, to change or adapt the way they provide telehealth services, the way they reimburse for telehealth services, and it it, uh, it set more into stone. You know, a, a statute is a little bit stronger than a regulation. It set more in stone uh, what is currently the the, the way uh, MoHealthNet will provide telehealth services. So the the big defining statutes here are uh, RISMO 191-1145, 208, uh, 670-208-677. So let's talk about that here. Let's, let's say, okay, so what does MoHealthNet, uh, what does MoHealthNet, how are they providing services or how do they view telehealth services now? How are they required to view them per the statute? So who can provide telehealth under Medicaid? Uh, any licensed healthcare provider shall be authorized to provide telehealth services. And a good question, at least a question for me when I read that is, what is a healthcare provider? 
But the definition that they cite there is a healthcare provider is a physician or other healthcare practitioner licensed, accredited, or certified by, by the state of Missouri to perform specified health services. So this essentially means anybody that has a license, a health li a, a license related to healthcare in the state of Missouri can provide telehealth services uh, under, under Medicaid. So dentists, nurse practitioners, uh, uh, chiropractors could, for example. The prior regulation had, had narrowed that down, had, had kind of combed through and, and and uh, limited the number of healthcare providers that provide services. This now is, is no longer the case. It's, the door is open uh, for that. So where can telehealth occur? Uh, again, the, the, the guiding statute is, is that anywhere you would already provide uh, care for in-person services, so long as it doesn't alter the scope of practice of a healthcare provider or fail to meet the standard of care. So there is no limitation, like it has to take place in a doctor's office, for example, and it has to take place in a hospital. That limitation doesn't exist now it's pretty much wide open to say, okay, you can provide care so long as it's uh, uh, where you would, you would typically provide for other in-person services, and so long as it doesn't alter the scope of what you're doing as a practitioner, uh, then, then you can provide care in, in that way. So the big question to me, because this is a little bit different for folks, and this is something that most folks uh, aren't used to, is under Medicaid, can FQHCs be distant sites? Uh, yes, you can, in fact. Which is, which is pretty unique, because in the past, uh, we'll talk about Medicare here in a second, but in the past, you could not serve as a distance site. You were essentially just an originating site. But yes, FQHCs can be distance sites uh, under Medicaid and receive reimbursement for those services provided. So how do you get paid under Medicaid? Well, Medicaid just changed, believe it or not, just changed <laughs> the, way they, the way they want you to, to note uh, your telehealth services. So they're following now what Medicare, a change Medicare had made uh, in the last two years. Uh, to use place of service codes, uh, not GT modifiers. So effective mid-August, uh, and the link is there to the provider bulletin, uh, MoHealthNet will require place of service codes uh, for, for the distant sites, the provider site, uh, and, and, I, and do away with the GT modifier. That was what Medicare has, has, gone, has gone through. I'd also want to, I want to make sure I note here with, with that, if you do place of service codes, when you, when you provide those services, uh, providers, uh, health centers have to remove charges and payments for telehealth services uh, from their year-end cost report. Again, I have that uh, noted uh, right here with, with the hyperlink uh, to provide you with the information there and the guidance there. So originating site fees, uh, health centers can get originating site fees through Medicaid. Not as good, they're not a good, as good a reimbursement under Medicare, but under Medicaid, uh, here's the coding that you'd need to use. Uh, the originating site and distance site services can be billed by the same provider. So if your health center is, is a distance site and the originating site, you can, you can bill uh, on the same date of services so long as the distance site is not located in the originating site facility. Uh, and so here we go, the effective dates uh, for billing for the originating site fee. You can't bill more than 1649 in order to receive the 15 and 17 uh, maximum reimbursement for the originating site fee. Uh, and then uh, claims will be subject to post-payment review and those reimbursed will be adjusted to recoup the difference. So just a, a heads up on the originating site fee. Two things to note. Uh, first, store and forward. MoHealthNet now does allow asynchronous store and forward. I'm not sure how many of you have used store and forward before or, or would want to use store and forward. Uh, but it essentially means that seeing a patient, uh, it doesn't have to be done with live interactive video. So it, it, the information can be stored and reviewed by a physician later. Uh, and that physician can still uh, receive reimbursement for seeing that patient. It's, it's asynchronous, it's not occurring at the same time. So MoHealthNet does allow that. That's something to look into, that's something to consider. There are some good models out there for asynchronous store and forward, uh, and it's, it's a possibility now under Medicaid. Also to reimbursement, just in case you ever encounter this, reimbursement to the healthcare provider delivering the medical service to the distant site is equal to the current fee schedule amount for the service provided. So there is no differentiation uh, for telehealth. The, the, the reimbursement's not less, the reimbursement's not more, the reimbursement's the same, uh, regardless of whether you provide the services in person or uh, via telehealth. So that's Medicaid. Medicaid's a, a, a little bit more open-ended. It's a, got a lot more possibilities. Uh, we'll talk about Medicare now. It doesn't have as many possibilities, but I want to at least let you know a couple of things that, that uh, you can get into there. So every year, uh, Medicare releases uh, their telehealth services guide. Uh, I have a link to the current one. This is from February 2018. They update this every year with the codes they're going to reimburse uh, for, for telehealth. 
Uh, that doesn't necessarily apply to FQHCs, and I'll kind of get into that here in just a second. But so under Medicare, FQHCs are authorized to be originating sites. So again, originating sites are where the patients are, are at. Medicare requires certain things of originating sites. Uh, one, you have to be in a county outside of a, a metropolitan statistical area, or you have to be in a rural health professional shortage area. The easiest way to verify whether or not you can be an original, originating site or one of your sites can be an originating site and receive reimbursement under Medicare is to go to the Telehealth Payment Eligibility Analyzer. That's maintained by HRSA, and I have the link there on the, on the slide at the bottom. That, that's the easiest way to tell if you're going to be reimbursed or can be reimbursed as an originating site. So uh, again, this is uh, a little bit more about the originating site fee or getting the originating site reimbursement. Uh, reimbursement's a little bit higher, it's $25.76 uh, under Medicare. So again, you know, a little bit higher than, than under Medicaid. Uh, but again, there's the restriction. There's the restriction of uh, geographic location, which is not true under Medicaid. Medicaid does not have a geographic restriction here. The most important thing to know about Medicare though, uh, is this, uh, versus uh, unlike Medicaid, FQHCs are not authorized to be distance sites under Medicare. And this is locked down pretty tight. Uh, so this, this, is, this is from the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, which by the way, I have to mention, I've looked at the, the policy manual and, and I, have n I can't find uh, the, uh, any statutory basis or regulatory basis really for uh, Medicare not authorizing uh, FQHCs to be distant sites. So I, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't believe there's a law that prevents FQHCs from being distant sites under Medicare. But Medicare's policy manual states they are not authorized to be distant sites. So this could this is something that I suppose could change. Uh, be something you'd want to talk to about talk to your uh, uh, someone in Congress about. But uh, I, I'm not quite sure why uh, why Medicare would not allow FQHCs to be distant sites. But they're not. And again, it's locked down pretty tight. And this is from the policy manual. Uh, it says, this includes telehealth services that are furnished by an FQHC practitioner who is employed or under contract with the FQHC or an FQHC practitioner furnishing services through a direct or indirect contract. So the easiest thing to say is, is don't try to be a distance site under Medicare because there, uh, there, there are sanctions that go along with this, obviously, uh, and, and you wouldn't want to get into that. So when you think about telehealth, uh, be cognizant of that under Medicare. Medicare beneficiaries tend to be a smaller chunk of the FQHC pool in general. Again, Medicaid's larger, uh, so be aware of the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid being the one that's, under my uh, perspective, a little easier to work with in this case, uh, more open-ended, there are more possibilities. Medicare is not, it, it's pretty restrictive at this point. So let's talk about private insurers real quick. Uh, two things with private insurers to keep in mind. Again, this is even a smaller pool of the number of patients that, that, that come into FQHCs, but there are two things to keep in mind. Uh, one is that health carriers uh, are, are legally required uh, to, uh, to cover telehealth services. So they, they can't deny a claim just because it was provided via telehealth, right? So if you're a private health insurer, you have to cover telehealth services in the state of Missouri. And also you have to pay at the same rate. So the, the telehealth services must be paid on the same basis as in-person visits. So it, there may be different requirements from the private health insurers. There may be, uh, the, there may be different hoops to jump through, but they have to cover telehealth and they have to pay that on the same basis as the uh, So I, briefly, it was easier to pull out the public, uh, the public uh, insurers, so Medicare, Medicaid, because they make public all of their information. Uh, for private insurers, it's, it's not as easy. So I wanted to give some specific examples, but uh, most of the examples that we have, the, the policy guidances were essentially uh, something that they said don't share. So I, I have an example of one that I saw, which was Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, the, again, it, it kind of a mixed bag, but Anthem at the very least looked uh, very similar to MoHealthNet in, in the way it covered telehealth services. So there weren't restrictions on provider types, there weren't restrictions geography-wise, uh, like Medicare. It was pretty open-ended. So this is something, again, with private insurers, keep in mind those two things. One, they have to cover telehealth. Two, they have to pay telehealth the same rate they pay, uh, they pay for in-person visits. But again, they're going to vary uh, based on what they, uh, what they require you to do. So uh, work with them directly. So let's talk about some things that are non-reimbursement related. And these are uh, a couple considerations that I thought would be useful for, for the health centers. And there are a couple of things in here that I've been asked a number of questions on. 
And so this, these are non-reimbursement related, but these are uh, things that can uh, impact the practice that, uh, that, that you provide. So the first is the Hate Act, Ryan Hate Act. Very briefly, I have to give background on this just because I think it's, it's kind of interesting. So Ryan Hate, he was 18, 2001, uh, died of an overdose of, on Vicodin, and he got the Vicodin uh, through a provider online uh, and, and got it filled through a pharmacy online. So he received these drugs from a pharmacy in Oklahoma, from a pharmacist that was making you know, almost $6 million by filling prescriptions online. Oh, by the way, he's in prison right now, serving 20 years for, for doing this. But this was something, it, you know, this kind of came about at a time when state licensing boards were having a hard time regulating the industry because it was the, kind of the Wild West days of, of the internet. And a lot of freewheeling stuff going on. Napster was a good example of this, uh, where you're, 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 you're taking someone's music and you're, you're holding it as your own. You've got you know, copyright issues. There were a lot of issues around this time. So this is what came out of it. So the Ryan Haight uh, Online Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act of 2008. So this was originally sponsored by Senator Feinstein and Senator Sessions, who is kind of an odd couple right now. Uh, and it was renamed the Ryan Haight Act after Bart Stupak, who was a, a representative at the time, uh, sponsored a similar bill in the House. It, it's kind of interesting because his son uh, committed suicide in 2000, so he had a vested personal interest in this. Uh, and th all this is to say that, that this act was uh, in, in response to issues that had come up earlier. Ryan Haight was the, was the example. Uh, but the law is meant to be restrictive. It was meant to, to try to corral what was seen as, as kind of the Wild West as the internet was kind of coming uh, into full bloom. So this is the Hate Act. It essentially says, it, at least for telehealth, is that uh, no controlled substance that is a prescription drug uh, can be delivered by means of the internet without a valid prescription. And a valid prescription has to come from a professional that has seen uh, the, the person, has at least one person, one in-person medical evaluation of the patient unless uh, that practitioner is using telehealth, All right? So, so what, is, what is telehealth? What is telemedicine? So the practice of telemedicine is the practice of medicine uh, which is being conducted while the patient is being treated by and physically located in a hospital or clinic uh, that is DEA registered. So you can see the information here, uh, the first line there under A and the I is uh, registered under section uh, 823F of this title which is essentially the section that outlines how you get DEA registration. So the practice of telemedicine, again, is while the patient is being treated by and physically located in a hospital or clinic that is DEA registered, or is being conducted while the patient is being treated by and in the physical presence of a practitioner that's registered under, uh, as a DEA registration. Again, this is the example, this is the DEA registration information. So let's, let's talk about this. Let's, let me give you a good example of this. That's kind of the, the technical information. So here's an example, and I, I'm, I'm just picking on the Community Health Center of Central Missouri because I know it, it was easier for me to, to pull the, these guys out. So I'm just making this up, so that not, this isn't a real case. But so let's say you have a physician located in the Jefferson City Clinic, and you have a, a nurse practitioner and a patient located in Lynn. The Lynn Clinic, which is about 20, 30 miles to the east. And for the sake of this example, let's say that both the physician and the nurse practitioner are DEA registered. So what does the Hate Act mean in this case? What, what for if the, if, the, if the physician wants to uh, uh, write a prescription for a controlled substance, uh, something like uh, buprenorphine. So the physician utilizes live interactive telemedicine to see the patient in Lynn, while the nurse practitioner is physically present with the patient. And the physician can, can prescribe a controlled substance without having an in-person visit, without seeing that patient first. So you can use telemedicine to do this. You don't have to have the in-person visit if two things. One, that, that patient is physically present in a, a hospital or clinic that is DEA registered, or if that, that patient is uh, with someone a provider that has a DEA registration. So in this case, that physician can prescribe buprenorphine, and this kind of matters because you have all the waiver issues, all those types of things. So that physician can prescribe a controlled substance if that person is, uh, is in the physical presence or is located in a clinic that has a DEA registration. So in order to avoid sanctions, let's keep in mind, must have a DEA registered practitioner, so the practitioner obviously has to be able to, to prescribe controlled substances. Uh, you must have a DEA registered practitioner physically present with the patient or the clinic the patient is located in must have a DEA registration. 
and then you must act in the usual course of professional practice, uh, which is, it seems self-evident, but I was just want to make sure that, that you were aware of that. So the Hate Act expands, it, it restricts, but it also expands what's, what's possible to some degree to provide over telemedicine. So it, it's, a, it's a little less restrictive than you otherwise first think. Uh, but there are there there are some uh, there are some requirements that you have to meet to be able to provide uh, services or provide prescriptions uh, for controlled substances over the internet or via telemedicine. Uh, something I don't necessarily think a lot of people uh, know about. Perhaps you do. I, I'm not quite sure. But this is telehealth for collaborative practice. So this is a set of laws uh, that were passed a few years ago. Uh, in my previous job, I, I, I helped the board of healing arts and the, and the nursing board uh, kind of. Uh, come to some agreement on 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 how to implement these these laws, uh, and so this uh, is uh, telehealth for collaborative practice. So, under Missouri law, if an advanced practice registered nurse is providing services under a collaborative practice arrangement, which you have to, you can provide those services outside of the normal geographic restrictions, which are 30 miles or 50 miles, depending on where you're providing care. If the collaborating physician and the advanced practice registered nurse utilize telehealth in the care of the patient, and the services are provided in a rural area of need. What's a rural area of need? A rural area of need is any rural area of the state which is located in a health professional shortage area. And that having done health professional shortage areas and, and designated them for a long time, nearly every part of rural Missouri, save for uh, maybe one or two counties, is a health professional shortage area. Uh, so this is pretty much statewide. Something to note here too though is the provisions of this law sunset in August 28th or August of next year unless it's reauthorized by the General Assembly. So that would need to take place uh, next spring. But this is currently uh, in state law. This is currently uh, it's something that's, that's uh, implemented by the Board of Healing Arts and the Nursing Board. So let me give you an example of this. And I'm picking on Mo Highlands because they have a good geographic spread. Uh, so in the, in the case of Missouri Highlands, so let's say you have a nurse practitioner that's located here in their Van, Bu their Van Buren clinic, and her, her or his, their collaborating physician is located in the Poplar Bluff clinic, right? So let's say that nurse practitioner wants to see a patient via telehealth in the Viburnum clinic, which is here. Well, technically under state law, before this, uh, before this law was passed, you could not do that because Viburnum is 100 miles away from Poplar Bluff, and that exceeds the geographic restrictions. Uh, under a collaborative practice requirements. But now, if that nurse practitioner and that physician, in public, if they can use telehealth to, to connect to the Viburnum clinic, if that nurse practitioner is seeing that patient in Viburnum, he or she can legally see them even though it exceeds, uh, it exceeds the geographic requirements. Telehealth now, it, it allows you to exceed those geographic requirements and see those patients for their way. Generally, you have to see the patient, you have to be at least 30 or 50 miles uh, away from, you, can, you can't see patients further away than that from your collaborating position, but with telehealth, it allows you to exceed that, and Missouri Highlands provides a good example of what's possible with that. Uh, so this may, not take, this may not be something that applies to, uh, to, to everybody. Obviously, health centers in the metro areas, this is probably not something that, that applies to you as much. But for a, a number of uh, the, the health centers that are out in rural Missouri, I think that this could this could be something that you, you could pay attention to because of the, the geographic spread. Right. So briefly, I'm going to get into some frequently asked questions, and I'll open it up and see if anybody has any questions about anything that I've seen I've said. So frequently asked questions: Can FQHCs serve as distance sites? Again, yes, they can uh, under Mo Health Net. Uh, under Mo Health, Net, that's that's the important thing to say. Under Medicare, no, you cannot be a distance site. But under Mo Health Net, yes, you can be a distance site. All right, so something good to keep in mind. Do you need to be approved by the Missouri Telehealth Network to build Mo Health Net? Previously, yes. Now, no, you don't. That that's gone. I don't expect that to ever come back. So, no, you don't need to be approved. You don't have to get approval from any from anybody. You just it's it's part of the normal process now for Mo Health Net. Uh, again, telehealth services are seen essentially in the same light as in-person services. Most of the prior restrictions are gone now. Uh, one that's it's kind of an interesting one to me is, will a telemedicine claim be paid if the MoHealthNet patient was at their home? Uh, yes, it will. Again, uh, the patient's the originating site, so something like an app on the cell phone, uh, something like VA Video Connect, you know, or, or something like, probably not FaceTime, but uh, something like a Zoom connection, if a patient's at their home and they want to connect to the, the to their provider at the at the uh, at the health center, this is something that Mo Health Net will pay. The, the the patient does not need to come in; they can be seen uh, from their home. What if the provider is at home? Uh, will they get paid? Uh, yes, they will. Now, that would be something that you probably have to get into a little bit different with with your scope of project. 
uh, with HRSA that may be unique. I'm not quite sure who's, who's done that, if anybody has done that. Um, it, it wouldn't require, I don't think, too much. Again, it would be something that would probably be seen similarly uh, as just a, a, an addition of a service site or something similar to a mobile unit. But yes, a yeah, yeah, so provider can stay at home and provide services and, and still be paid. So something, uh, finally, this is something to keep an eye on. I just want to make sure that, that you're all aware of this. So Medicare every year comes out with a proposed rule for their physician fee schedule update. And so this, the comment period just closed for this, and this is a proposed rule. But a part of that proposed rule, a number of things, pushing the envelope more of what they're allowing for, tele, for telemedicine and telehealth. Uh, but this was something that I thought was, was kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know when the, the rule would be finalized. I don't know when payment for this would start. They say calendar year 19, uh, but uh, we'll see there. So this is recognizing communication technology-based services for RHCs and FQHCs. It's a great name. It's, it's a lovely name. But essentially what this is saying is that CMS is proposing a payment mechanism for rural health clinics and federally qualified health centers uh, for uh, telehealth and communication technology-based services and remote evaluation services that are furnished when there is no associated billable visit. So the services would be payable for medical discussions or remote evaluations of conditions not related to a service provided within the previous seven days or within the next 24 hours. Uh, so the one that came to my mind would be something uh, maybe related to a diabetic. Just uh, check in, make sure their insulin levels are okay. As long as they haven't been seen in the clinic in the previous seven days and they're not expected to be seen in the next 24 hours. Uh, so this is, a, this is a way, I don't know what the reimbursement rate would be for, the, for this. Um, I don't necessarily know if it's going to come out at the end of the finalized rule. is going to look like the proposed rule. But at the very least, I think this is a step in the right direction, because if you remember, Medicare does not allow FQHCs to be distant sites. But this is essentially allowing one very tiny service. This is allowing an FQHC to be a distant site. So it's not inconceivable that this is a step in the direction of Medicare saying, OK, community health centers, yes, you can be distant sites. Uh, we're not there yet. I haven't heard uh, anybody at Medicare propose that yet. But again, I think this is something that is a step in that direction. So something to keep an eye on. Uh, and then finally, yeah, wrap up, take advantage of telehealth, support expand. I think the opportunity for telehealth to fulfill the promises, uh, to fulfill its promise to increase access to care, lower costs, improve quality of care. Uh, I, think it, I think now it's possible, whereas previously it, it wasn't so much. But now is the right time. Also, too, we have a session at the PCA conference. It's not just me talking. I'll, I'll give an abbreviated version of this talk, but it's also some folks that are on the ground. So it's Rich Lillard, uh, Dana Roberts, Dana. Uh, describing how they've used telehealth to actually provide services. I'll again give some background on telehealth from maybe a more global or general perspective, but they're going to get more specific. And this is the PCA conference. This is the Thursday, uh, 930 to 1045. So come see us. Love to see you. Love to meet you. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And if anybody has any questions, uh, by all means, please feel free uh, to ask. And yes, uh, you will get the slides. I'll be sure to share the slides with everybody. Okay, let me see if I have some questions. Uh, briefly, uh, is there a requirement? So, Carolyn Day, this is from Family Health Center. Uh, Family Care Health Center. For services, is there a requirement of a copay or some arrangement to make this a bona fide visit, i.e., this would apply for our on call providers answering calls after hours? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, to be honest. Can you clarify that question a little bit, Caroline? If you're still on. So I just know, having previously um, practiced in California, where Kaiser is, and you said like so many of their visits are, um, you know, through telehealth. Yeah. I know that some of the insurers out there, including Kaiser, had you pay fifty dollars a month to have access to this service. Um, so I just didn't know because, like, when we deliver care in the office, you know, we have to treat everyone the same. We have to collect copays. And so how is this different? Um, and I guess since they're not paying much per visit, maybe um, you know, doing something that's 
kind of enable somebody to seek this kind of service isn't necessary? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, the $50 a month or something like that, an enabling or a copay, generally the way to answer that, I may, I may not be able to specifically answer, but generally the way to answer is, is that telehealth uh, for, uh, unless there's a private insurer that, that I'm not aware of, and I haven't heard this, but generally telehealth now is seen, it's, it's viewed in the same way as an in-person visit, uh, right? So anything that would apply it for an in-person visit or anything that you would otherwise do, uh, if you do it via telehealth, there, there, there's no difference. There's nothing unique now to the provision of telehealth that makes it any different than what you would otherwise normally do. So uh, co-pays, de deductibles, all these types of things, Telehealth is not uh, is not unique in that it, the same rules essentially apply for telehealth as they do for in-person visits. That did that makes sense. Does that help? I'm just trying to think of the feasibility of this, and you know, when does it apply and when doesn't it? We envisioned only using it to help with our MAT um, patients, where we can't have one counselor, you know, physically in two places, but maybe if we did this, he could be helping people at the other site. Yeah. But the way you brought it up, it seems like it, it could apply to many more services. Yeah, it definitely could. Yeah. Uh, I definitely think it, it opens the door pretty wide. I mean, there, the, the restrictions that were previously there, again, aren't there now. And, and the, the doors open pretty wide for, for possibilities of ways to use telehealth. So they would just be billed for the copays, is that correct? Yes. Yep. In the same way you would uh, under a normal situation or under a situation that didn't use telehealth. Yep. Let me see. I'll back up here and do a question. So, there, Carolyn. So, does the distance site have to be in Missouri? The distance site does not have to be in Missouri. This is a this is always a fun question because once you start digging through MoHealth and that's from provider manuals and all this type of stuff. Uh, th this isn't necessarily clear, but no, the distance site does not have to be in Missouri. But uh, it, for a distance site that is outside of Missouri, the, essentially the, the rule is, is that provider has to be, of course, licensed in Missouri, it has to be enrolled as a provider under MoHealthNet, uh, and has to follow uh, uh, Missouri law, essentially, in providing those services for where the patient's located, if that makes sense. So essentially, it's the law, uh, so essentially the way to look at this is that uh, if the originating site is located in Missouri, anyone from any distance site, any location in, in the country uh, has to provide services as if they were in Missouri. They have to be a licensed provider in the state of Missouri. They have to be enrolled under MoHealthNet if it's a MoHealthNet uh, claim. Uh, so that's the way that you would view that. So uh, can you say more about clients being served from their home and how that works for FQHCs? So essentially, uh, the, with the idea of, of providing services from home, uh, if you have a way to securely connect uh, that, that patient at home with a provider, if that's, if that's what you're doing, uh, it essentially works in the same way as a normal visit would because the originating site, again, under Medicaid is where the patient is located. And that does not have to be a clinic. It does not have to be a hospital. It doesn't have to be a, a medical facility of any kind. It can be wherever the patient is located. So you can receive reimbursement for services that you provide to that patient. There are, again, some things you need to think about as far as HIPAA compliance, what services you can, you can legitimately provide to them. Uh, but you can do that now under Medicaid and receive reimbursement for it. Specifically for an FQAC, the only thing that I would say that would be that you'd have to pay attention to is, again, that you're... Uh, at least under the scope that you have with HRSA, if you are providing services, uh, if you are providing for service sites, that may be something that you need to consider with your scope of practice. So again, it's kind of like a mobile clinic. You know, if you have a if you have a van driving around providing dental services, you have to, I think you have to look at that a little bit differently under your scope because you're now having multiple service sites wherever the van's parked. Uh, and so this would be something similar, I think, when you're looking at providing services to patients that may be located in their home. Uh, it, it will, will HRSA look at that and say that's a service site? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. It probably depends on, on the scope that, of, of care that you're providing. If you're seeing, uh, you know, 100 different patients, providers located at the same site, but you're seeing 100 patients and they're all in their homes, uh, do you have to have a service site 
for every patient home. I'm not 100% sure on that or how HRSA would see that, but that would be something that I would pay attention to before you would fully implement the idea of seeing patients from their home. That's the biggest thing for F2HCs is that, that scope of service if you're adding all of these different sites in. That makes sense. So would, so would we have to have a uh, nurse there with the client? Uh, no. Uh, not uh, there is no requirement there. There's no requirement for what they used to call or what we still call a telehealth presenter. Uh, there, there's no requirement uh, from from MoHealthNet for that to occur. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, let me see. This was from Amber Dixon. Can you please clarify again any specifications about supervision locations as it relates to remote site and originating site for an MD who is supervising an APRN under collaborative agreement? I believe this is the language as well. Any specifications about supervision locations? Can you say, Amber, are you still on? Can you ask that? Oh, out there you are. Okay. I found you. Let me, there we go. Okay. I, I understand there's some, um, I, I don't know the terminology enough to ask for it, but I understand there's some requirements. There used to be maybe like a mileage requirement that the MD had to be within so many miles of the registered nurse practitioner. Yeah. I don't know if that had changed as of August 28th. Yeah, so uh, so no, so the, the with the telehealth collaborative practice, so the mileage restrictions still exist. So the geographic restrictions that you still have to be, if you're not in a health professional shortage area in the state of Missouri, the nurse practitioner and the physician have to be located within 30 miles of each other. If you are in a health professional shortage area providing in-person visits, uh, you have to be within 50 miles of each other. But if you're using telehealth, if that nurse practitioner and that physician are using telehealth, then those geographic restrictions uh, to seeing patients are, are removed. There is no mileage limitation. So you as a nurse practitioner could break, uh, not break, you can exceed what you would normally not be able to exceed, which those mileage restrictions, you can exceed that to provide care. So you could be in, again, using the, the example that I had, you could be in a, a city uh, or in a clinic providing care to a patient that's located in a clinic 100 miles away from you and 100 miles away from your, collaborative, your collaborating physician and, and still receive reimbursement for those services and still legally be able to provide those services. Whereas in person, you, you couldn't do that. You have to be within that geographic cone. Right. I think that answers our question. Thank you so much. Okay. Yep. You're welcome. Yep. And the date on that, I should say, is that, that that law is scheduled to sunset next year. So if the, if the legislature does not reauthorize that legislation, uh, then that, 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 uh, that geographic openness will, uh, will sunset. It will go away. It will no longer be allowable uh, after next year. So something maybe to keep an eye on. But it's still at least good for the next year, guaranteed. And I would imagine the legislature will reauthorize that law and make it good for another 10 years. But just, you know. Okay, okay. It's exciting. It's exciting. Yep. Good. Uh, I have one more from Maria. Uh, 181, 1145, any provider. We are a dental service and therefore dentists qualify under any provider license in Missouri. So now services provided don't need a qualifier that it was via telehealth. Uh, no, other than the distance site has to use, and this is MoHealth that just recently changed this, you have to use a place of service code. Um, but and no, there's, there's no qualifier other than when you bill, making sure that you bill with that place of service code to note that it was provided via telehealth. Um, but otherwise, yeah, there's, there's no qualifier. But is there, do you want to follow up on that, Maria? You're still there? Oh, okay, good. Nope, I'm right here. No, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Um, obviously, we're a unique little segment, but uh, I loved what you told me about providers because we're licensed providers in the state, so it's not an aside, oh, yeah, then there's dental. It's, it's by Medicaid. It's a licensed provider in the state, so yep. I appreciate right. that. That's great. Yep. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, yeah, if you have any connections with folks at Comtree, they have done some pretty amazing stuff. I know Nathan, Dr. Nathan Suter, a uh, dentist out there, he's done some pretty cool stuff with telehealth services. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely something to take a look at. Great, thanks. You're welcome. So this is Dr. Shelley Cooper. Uh, does there need to be a licensed provider with the patient at the originating site? Example, could behavioral health services take place in the patient's home without a supervising healthcare provider being present in the home? Uh, 
yeah, I, that uh, there, there's nothing that I've seen that, that that requires. There's no law that requires a provider to be physically present with the, the patient. We talked about the Hate Act, so providing controlled substances via telemedicine. Uh, that's one of the things that you have to that you can use if you want to if you want to provide or prescribe controlled substances without having an in-person visit done. But that aside, in general. Uh, no, there's there's no requirement for a licensed provider to be physically present at the originating site or any anyone other than the patient to be present at the originating site. There's no need for a telehealth presenter. Um, so yes, you can you can uh, you can provide behavioral health services to a patient in their home uh, without a provider being there, obviously, uh, and receive reimbursement for that. And so the uh, providing services in an in an elementary school from an FQHC. Uh, Schools are looked at as, as slightly different. Uh, again, that there are some there are some different requirements under that because you're dealing with consent. You're dealing with with those types of things since you're dealing oftentimes. Well, in this case, the school you're dealing with you know, uh, minors. Uh, but in general, again, yeah, the, the elementary school that would be something that would uh, that would be possible. Definitely possible. Uh, let's see, Farrick, I was advised by the MoHealth Net dental billing trainer that the place of service code only applies to medical services, not to dental services. Is this still correct? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, so with the, the provider bulletin that I have, and I have it on the slides, and you'll get the slides, the provider bulletin that, that updated the place of service code, it doesn't specifically note that it's that 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 place of service code is not applicable to dental services. It doesn't like, essentially carve out dental services. Uh, it doesn't say that it's only for medical services. Um, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure. It could be, I don't know when you got the training. Uh, it could be possible uh, that uh, that's been updated since. So the provider bulletin just came out not even a month ago. It came out in the middle of August that said MoHealthNet's going to start you know, requiring the use of, of a place of service code for telehealth. Um, so I don't want to say your trainer's wrong, uh, but I don't want to say they're, say they're right either. I would say look at that look at that provider bulletin uh, that, that I have referenced in there uh, and, and check and see. And if, if you still question that, then maybe that would be something to direct towards Mo Health. Net. But I don't I don't see anything that carves out dental services within that provider bulletin. And yes, I will. Uh, I'll send out to everybody that was registered. I'll send out a recording of the presentation and I'll send out the slides as well uh, after we're finished. Okay, that's all I have in the chat. Does anybody have any remaining questions uh, that, that are still on? Anything to type in or anything to ask? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining. Just a second. Oh, hang on. One more question. Yep, go ahead. So this, this applies to um, therapy too as well, right? Uh, can you be a little more specific as far as with therapy? So like in-home therapy. Uh, yeah. I, so again, it, 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 the, the requirements are uh, any life. It, so MoHealthNet will cover in MoHealthNet or, or state law, at least in the state of Missouri. You can provide telehealth services if you're a licensed healthcare provider. Uh, yes. So therapy in that case, uh, it depends on who's providing the therapy. If that therapist uh, is a licensed uh, professional counselor, for example, a marriage and family therapist, a psychologist, yes, they can provide it. If that person is a, a community health worker, for example, um, mm -hmm. actually, no, they can't because they don't have a statewide certification uh, or license. Uh, or that some, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So you have to have you have to you have to meet that threshold of having a license or certification that's statewide. But yeah, otherwise, okay. in general, yeah, you, you can. All right. Thanks for letting me fly that in under the wire. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Not a problem. Not a problem. If anybody has any questions, anything further uh, afterwards, by all means, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and stop. And again, thank you. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy yourselves and uh, talk to you again soon. Bye.